I'm Gary Halbert, and this is Brad Freeman, and we are uh, health consultants with the Indiana Department of Labor, and today we're going to be talking about hearing conservation. Um, what is occupational noise? Um, basically, it's any sound in the work environment, um, rapid, rapid variations of atmospheric pressure caused by some disturbance of the air. It can travel through any elastic medium, um, air, wood, water, metal. Um, when air molecules are set to vibrate, the ear perceives the variations in the pressure of sound. And in the workplace, sound that is intense enough to damage hearing is unwanted and is therefore considered to be noise. Um, unwanted noise, uh, ANSI defines uh, unwanted noise as something that interferes with communication, causes fatigue, uh, distracts or is irritating, and reduces morale or efficiency of the worker. Noise and hearing loss, there's about 30 million workers that are exposed to hazardous noise on the job. Um, Noise-induced hearing loss is the most common occupational hazard of American workers. Um, hearing loss for, from noise is slow and painless. Uh, you can have a disability before you notice it. If you have to raise your voice to speak with someone only three feet away, um, you're in a high hazard uh, noise area and um, hearing loss is 100% preventable. And this is a chart of common noise levels. As you can see, these are common activities, uh, gunshot, um, people working in grain elevators, operating chainsaws, um, rock bands, um, circular saws. A gunshot can have an impact sound of uh, well over 150 decibels. Um, firecrackers are well over 125 decibels, but working in a grain elevator, you can be above 100 decibels as well. Um, if anybody goes to rock concerts, um, the sound um, a lot of people notice when they come out of a, a rock concert that their uh, ears would be ringing um, and those decibel levels will exceed 100 decibels as well. Okay, the Occupational uh, Safety and Health Administration uh, has developed an uh, Occupational Noise Exposure Standard, it's 1910.95. And basically what it says, when information indicates that an employer's exposure, exposure is, uh, at, exceeds eight hour time weighted average of 85 decibels, um, the employer uh, shall develop and implement a monitoring program. And according to OSHA, the best uh, instrument to use is a decimeter. The basic components of a hearing conservation program are uh, monitoring employee noise, noise exposures, develop and implement a written hearing conservation program if the, the sound levels uh, exceed 85 decibels for an eight hour time weighted average for an individual. Um, the, the components of the hearing conservation program include um, the annual training on hazardous effects of excessive noise, um, how to effectively use hearing protection, um, provide hearing protection and force the use above the permissible exposure limit of 90 decibels, and conduct annual audiometric testing of anybody exposed above eight hour uh, time weighted average of 85 decibels. And the highest permissible noise exposure for the unprotected ear is 115 decibels for 15 minutes per day. Any noise above 140 decibels is not permitted by OSHA. And this is a chart of the permissible noise exposure. If you look on the bottom, uh, you see the uh, decibel level. So it starts at 85 and increases to 115 decibels. And on top is the time that an employee may be exposed. For, so for uh, 85 decibels, an employee exposed to 85 decibels can be exposed for 16 hours per day. Um, 90 decibels, is, again, is the permissible exposure limit, and they can only be exposed um, for uh, eight hours a day. And as the decibel level increases, the time that an employee can be exposed um, decreases. And this is irregardless of whether or not an employee is wearing hearing protection. The first step in an effective hearing conservation program is conducting noise monitoring. Um, there's two ways to do that. You can use a, a noise decimeter um, or you can use um, a sound level meter. Um, the noise decimeter is more accurate, uh, but an employee must monitor all employees who may have an exposure that equals or is greater than 85 decibels for an eight hour time weighted average. And this is an illustration of the uh, noise decimeters that we use. There's uh, many different types on the market, but we use the 3M noise decimeters. And these are worn by an employee on their shoulder. Um, we typically conduct seven to eight hour uh, noise samples 
And a noise uh, dissimilar consists of the, the microphone on the top and then there's a windscreen uh, that covers the microphone. It also has a preamplifier, uh, weighted network, fast and slow response time, an internal clock, calculator, and memory to store the log data. Um, and what it does uh, basically is that it averages the noise levels for the time that, that the employee is uh, wearing it. And it's good for noise levels that are not consistent. Say you're, um, if you have a sound level meter and you're going around your facility and you're getting below 80 decibels in some areas and above 100 in other areas, um, then it's gonna be difficult to tell what the employee's actual eight hour time weighted average, average exposure is. So the noise decimeter is a better um, instrument to use for that. You can use uh, sound level meters, and a sound level meter is good for when the sound levels are fairly consistent. Um, you can also, we use those to, when we're doing eight hour time, uh, samples with the noise dissimilar, we, we spot check uh, different areas with the sound level meter. Um, and it generally, if, if you're using a sound level meter, you have to take um, a lot of different readings in, at different times of the day in different areas of the facility. And again, if you have employees that are, are roaming from uh, different areas um, and the sound levels um, are markedly different, then you would want to use a noise decimeter rather than a sound level meter. Again, sound level meter versus the decimeter. Area monitoring can be used to estimate the noise exposure. Again, the sound level uh, would have to be fairly consistent uh, to get any, any uh, type of accurate reading. Um, and in a workplace where employees move about, then you'd want to use a noise decimeter. The noise decimeter and the sound level meter each has um, a, about a two uh, decibel plus or minus margin of error. How often do you repeat noise monitoring? Uh, the OSHA standard actually says when there are significant changes in machinery or production processes that may result in increased noise levels, um, we get a lot of calls to do uh, noise monitoring. And so we'll go out and we'll put the noise disseminator on a person and um, we may put it on a person and, and the company may already have a hearing conservation program, but not everybody's included. And frequently we'll find that you know, people, again, move from area to area. So um, they may be overexposed um, above the 85 decibels. And those people have to be included in the hearing conservation program. And that includes employees that um, say they're only uh, filling in for other employees in high noise areas, but if they're um, exposed above 85 decibels, even for one day a year, then they have to be included in the hearing conservation program. Uh, when it comes to automatic, autometric testing, sometimes referred to as audiograms or hearing tests, uh, this is a key component um, of any hearing conservation program. Um, although it's a lagging indicator, it gives us a lot of valuable information. Can tell, it can validate um, if our hearing conservation program is working successfully. It can also identify problem areas. Now, employers um, do have the obligation to um, ensure that uh, audiograms are completed for any employee that is exposed to noise levels at or above the uh, action level of 85 decibels measured over eight hours. Uh, not only baseline audiograms but annual audiograms as well. Uh, the baseline audiogram uh, should be completed within the first six months of employment uh, that the employee is exposed to uh, noise levels at or above the action level. The sooner the better. Um, that way you know um, if a, an employee is coming into your organization uh, with any type of hearing impairment. Um, the, the reason that the audiograms are so valuable is, is because it's a way to look back over time and to see what types of changes, uh, if any, uh, an employee may experience. Uh, again, those audiograms are, um, should be um, at no cost to the employee. Now, um, there's a couple of different types of uh, noise-induced hearing loss. One is a temporary threshold shift. And I think a lot of us have experienced this. You may go out and mow your yard, you may go to a concert, and after you shut the lawnmower off or you leave the concert, you're, you'll have a mild ringing in your ears uh, or your ears will feel like they're stopped up. Um, that's because the 
the uh, the hearing uh, uh, cilia in your ears have become fatigued. Uh, usually, if you remove yourself from that noise source from an uh, extended period of time, that goes away. That's in contrast to a permanent uh, threshold shift. Uh, bec unfortunately, because um, the hearing cells do not uh, regenerate, once uh, hearing cells are damaged or, or even begin to die off, they don't regenerate, and that's when a person has uh, a hearing loss. Uh, now, uh, OSHA does have a definition for a standard threshold shift, um, and, and that is any change in a, in a person's hearing compared to that baseline uh, audiogram of 10 or more decibels in one or both ears. And that's usually at the 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 uh, frequency range because that's the, the range uh, of speech and that's one of the most important ranges. If, a, if an employee does experience a standard threshold shift, uh, the employer uh, has to notify the employee within 21 days uh, of the standard threshold shift. Now the employer should um, retest. They have 30 days to do retesting and there's some valid reasons to retest. Uh, the employee may have had a head cold, may have had something as simple as earwax in the canal, um, or could have had a temporary threshold shift from, from seeing a um, hearing a concert or being at a race. Um, if uh, after the second um, audiogram, uh, if there's still a, a standard threshold shift, then the employer um, at that time does have to re record that um, as an illness within seven days on their OSHA 300 logs. Uh, but more importantly, they should um, evaluate the area and see why there is a standard threshold shift. It could be something as simple as, as the employee not wearing a hearing protector correctly. Uh, so it's a good time to revisit and, and to train, maybe do some retraining on properly wearing hearing protectors or even um, requiring hearing protection at that time. Um, the employer might also even consider moving that employee to a less noisy area. Uh, frequency range for humans are 20 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. Uh, anything below 20 hertz uh, is not perceivable. Uh, by human hearing, we call that infrasound, and anything above 20,000 hertz is ultrasound. Again, we don't perceive that in our hearing. Uh, now, just because it's below 20 hertz and you don't perceive that doesn't mean it doesn't affect you. In fact, there, there have been studies of adverse effects of uh, frequency ranges below 20. Uh, some of the most important ranges, though, for speech um, is around 250 up to 6,000 hertz. 250 uh, hertz is around our vowel sounds. As we go up higher in frequencies, that's where um, our consonants um, are, are mostly in, in, in the top ranges. So as, as we lose those higher frequency ranges, uh, communication uh, becomes very jumbled and very difficult uh, to understand. Uh, a lot of times uh, people lose a lot of quality of life. Okay, There are some hearing protection rules of thumb um, without even having a hearing test. Those are if you find yourself uh, having to, to speak very loudly within three feet of someone to understand them or um, you may need, uh, you may be in a work environment that, where you need hearing protection. Um, if uh, if you, again, if you're mowing your yard or if you're leaving a concert and you, and you feel this ringing in your ears or feel like your ears are being plugged a little bit, uh, that, that is definitely an indication that you, you may need hearing protection. Also, if you wake up and you start the car and you, your, you, uh, your radio is blaring, you, f you have to turn the radio down, whereas the, the night before when you left to work, it was fine. Uh, these are all telltale signs that you may be working in an environment that you need to wear some type of hearing protectors. So when is hearing protection required? Well, um, first of all, anything above the action level, the employer has to provide at least two types of hearing protection. It's not required at that point, but they have to provide it. Uh, but it is required uh, until that audio first audiogram uh, is conducted. Um, it is also required if an employee has a, a standard threshold shift. And any time um, that an employee is in a work environment above the PEL for noise, um, hearing protection is required. Okay. Now there are many types of hearing protectors out 
on the market. Of course, the best type would be just to engineer out the noise, but if that's not feasible, um, what you want is to provide at least two types of hearing protectors for your employees, uh, because not everyone's hair, ear canals are the same. Uh, so you, you're wanting to look for employee comfort. Uh, you want to look at what type of environment that the employee is working in. Uh, you want to look at the duration that the employee is around the noise source. Uh, you want to look at um, the attenuation of the, um, the hearing protector itself. Here's some, uh, some examples of hearing protectors. You can see there's earmuffs, um, there are foam, uh, you have the flanged uh, hearing protectors, and also there's custom molded um, hearing protectors as well. All of these have pros and cons to them, and it would be best for the employer to do an assessment to see which hearing protector works best for their environment. Okay, some of the common problems of hearing protection. Number one, uh, the employee has to wear the hearing protection. Uh, Brad and I have both been in facilities. We were both uh, IOSHA compliance officers for several years. And on inspections, we've seen employees take the foam, uh, those yellow foam plugs, and just put them in their ear and not roll them up and then actually insert them into the uh, ear canal. Um, so they provide no protection, but their supervisor believes they're wearing them. Um, we see that all the time. So number one, um, they have to be worn. Um, the studies have shown that one half of the workers wearing hearing protection receive one half or less of the noise reduction potential of the protectors due to the hearing protectors not fitting properly, um, not being worn continuously when areas of excessive noise levels. That, again, we see that all the time um, when employees just forget to wear hearing protection or don't like wearing, nobody likes wearing hearing protection, um, but um, it's necessary to protect their ears. Um, even if they're worn uh, continuously, a lot of times um, earmuffs, um, especially if somebody has a, a beard or obstructions, there can be leakage um, noise coming into and they're not getting a tight seal of the earmuffs. Um, Brad talked a little bit um, about um, the custom molded type. Uh, those are very effective because they're molded to the individual ear canal and so they reduce leakage and outside noise um, coming into the ear canal. Um, hearing protectors, uh, proper use. Uh, the employer is responsible for ensuring that the hearing protection uh, fits um, the employee. Um, the employer is responsible again for ensuring that um, the employee is wearing the hearing protection in areas where um, noise sampling has indicated that employees are exposed above the action level of 85 decibels. Um, the hearing protectors must be replaced as necessary. I've, I've had questions before um, from employers asking whether or not um, they can require employees to pay for their own after they've provided them one pair and they've lost it. And the answer is no, that the employer, again, uh, is, is required to provide two different types. And hearing protection devices must be cleaned and stored according to the manufacturer's uh, specifications. We go into a lot of facilities and there may be um, oily or dirty environments, um, oil mists, and if, if the uh, hearing protection must be rolled up by a uh, person's hands, then they could get um, dirt, grease, oils um, into their ear canal causing infections and uh, different types of uh, problems. Uh, there's a noise reduction rating on each type of hearing protection that's uh, provided. Uh, typically you see it on the uh, package 32 decibels, 33 decibels um, is, is kind of a common um, reduction uh, rating on, on uh, noise or hearing protection. Um, and what it tells is how many decibels are blocked, but it's not a one-for-one -one relationship. It doesn't mean that if your hearing protection um, is, is rated at, at the noise reduction rated, it, rating is 30 decibels, it doesn't mean that it's going to give you an actual 30 decibels worth of uh, reduction again because of leakage and um, not being worn properly and that type of thing. Um, OSHA has in one of the appendices to the uh, 1910 uh, 95 standard, um, there is a formula to calculate what the actual uh, noise reduction rating is. Uh, OSHA does subtract the noise reduction rating by 50%. The other component of a, an effective hearing conservation program is training. Within 30 days of enrollment in the hearing conservation program and every 12 months thereafter, uh, the employee must be trained in the effects of noise on hearing, purpose and value of wearing the hearing protective 
protection devices, uh, advantages and disadvantages of wearing hearing protection devices, uh, how to care for your hearing protection devices and clean them, and purpose and value of audiometric testing. We do get a question every once in a while on the extended work shifts. Um, the OSHA technical, technical manual defines um, how much um, the action level uh, could be decreased when employees are working extended work shifts. So if an employee is working eight hours, again, the action level is 85 decibels. But if an employee works for 10 hours, and that's typical in a lot of facilities, 10 hours per day, then the action level goes down to 83.4. And if somebody is working 16 hours a day, then the action level would go down to 80 decibels. However, the permissible exposure limit still remains at 90. It does not decrease with uh, the number of hours that you work. So we've covered um, basically what sound is, uh, what unwanted noise is, um, and we've talked about the, the basic components of an effective hearing conservation program, which are number one, um, conducting noise monitoring, um, and then employees that are exposed above 85 decibels, the company has to uh, develop and implement a written hearing conservation program, which includes um, annual training, providing hearing protection, and conducting annual audiometric testing. Again, my name is Brad Freeman, and this is Gary Holbert. We are health consultants with the InSafe division. Um, again, this was just a very brief presentation. If you have detailed questions, please feel free to contact us at any time. If you feel the need that you need any type of noise sampling, we will come out to your facility and we do that for free. Thank you.